Amos chapter 8, please. The 8th chapter of the Hebrew prophet Amos. As you looked at yesterday, in the days of Hosea, Hoshea Hanavi, Israel was in a treacherous, treacherous state. It was in a state of backsliding from the Lord. It was in a terrible state spiritually. It was in a terrible state morally. There was also a lot of social injustice and inequity despite the proliferation of wealth. God could not even find the prophet from among the people until, Amos, uh, until Hosea came along, but he sent Amos up from the south. In the seventh chapter of Amos, they tell him basically, go back where you came from. Go back where you came from. They call him derogatorily a seer in verse 12. Amos, Amaziah said to Amos, go you seer, flee away to the land of Judah and eat bread and there do your prophesying, but no longer prophesy at Bethel, for it is the sanctuary of the king and a royal residence. Now notice what the people were doing. Go back where you came from. Get out of here. We don't need anybody from Judah and Israel. We don't need any Yanks in Australia or whatever. We don't need any Israelis in Britain. We just get out of here. Not that I'm calling myself a prophet, but that's the idea. He came and he didn't like what he was saying. But notice what they were saying. How dare you prophesy at Bethel, which means house of God. However, God's house was not at Bethel. God's house was in Jerusalem. To them, it was the royal residence, the residence of the king. What made it holy to them was their self-proclaimed big wheel leaders. <laughs> they weren't offended about the Lord. They didn't have the Lord. How dare you say this to us? How dare you speak this way about our king? How dare you speak this way about us? They canonized their corrupt leaders. They were turning wicked men into heroes, calling them righteous. But they weren't. Amos responds, the Lord took me from following the flock of the Lord in verse 15 and said to me, go prophesy to my people Israel. So often, when God calls somebody in a time of peril, they were shepherds. David was a shepherd. Moses was a shepherd of Midian. The Hebrew word for shepherd is the same word for pastor. Or oh, hey, Psalm 23, Yahweh Roi, Yahweh is my shepherd. Greek episcopal, episcopal, we get the word episcopal, bishop, the one who looks out, has the root word skopos in Greek. Uh, he who is faithful in little is faithful in much. In times of peril, very often the people God has called in the Bible were shepherds. And of course, this is the same word for pastor. And they all prefigure Jesus as the good shepherd in John chapter 10. He said, I didn't want to be here. God called me to this. Now hear the word of the Lord. You shall not prophesy against Israel nor speak against the house of Isaac. Therefore, thus says the Lord, your wife will become a harlot. And of course, he sets the stage for his successor, Amos, who would say the same thing. Well, what was his response? His response is, I am not the prophet or a son of a prophet. I am simply somebody who looks over the sheep. I'm not a prophet or the son of a prophet. That is exactly what he said. Those were his exact words. I'm not a prophet nor the son of a prophet. True prophets do not want to be prophets. True prophets do not want the job. When you see people running around claiming to be prophets, they're inevitably false ones. A true prophet does not have to claim to be a prophet. If he is a prophet, those who are the Lord's will know a prophet has spoken. They don't have to claim to be a prophet. Additionally, they don't want to be a prophet. The only ones who want to be a prophet are false prophets. The reason false prophets want to be a prophet is because there's profit in it. That's the only reason. Only false prophets want to be prophets. This is the background. When we study a passage from the Old Testament, the Tanakh as we're going to do now, there are always certain things we have to bear in mind, certain questions. What is for the prophet's own time? What is for the first coming of Jesus? 
And what is for the return of Jesus? As we looked at yesterday, the prophets prophesied for three time frames. We should always look at a passage, what is purely for his own time, what is for the first coming of Christ, what is for the last days, the return of Christ. Now to begin with, unless we know what it meant for his own time, we will not know what it means for the future. We establish the sits of Nabon. Secondly, we're looking for the distinction between a peshet and a pesher. What is purely literal? What is literal that has some kind of a deeper spiritual meaning? Bearing in mind the deeper spiritual meaning does not negate the literal one. Be careful of people who try to negate literal meaning by spiritualizing texts out of context. That is Gnosticism. It is dangerous. We never, ever, ever base a doctrine on a type or an allegory or on midrash. I could set up the Lord's ta uh, Passover Seder table and demonstrate the doctrine of atonement through the ritual symbolism of the Passover Seder. I could do that. I could demonstrate the doctrine of atonement based on the symbolism of the Seder. But that's not the basis of atonement. You use typology, allegory, symbolism, midrash. These things illustrate doctrine. They illuminate doctrine on a much deeper level, but they're not the basis of doctrine. Be careful of somebody who will base doctrine on literary symbolism of any form. But when we look at a text, we have to ask, what is literal? What is literal but also symbolic? Next thing we have to ask, what is ethnocentric purely for Israel and the Jews? And what is for Israel and the Jews that also applies to the church? We've got to sort those things out. What's literal? What's both literal and spiritual? What applies to Israel? What applies to Israel that also applies to the church? What is for his first coming? What is for his second coming? What is for the prophet's own time? But these things can occur in combinations. Sometimes prophecies are doubly referenced. Sometimes they all occur in the same passage, even the same verse. There are multiple aspects. The Protestant reformers were anxious to correct the errors of the Roman Catholicism out of which they were saved. Bear in mind, Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, all these people, Cranmer, Every one of them was a Roman Catholic priest who read the Bible. Every one of them was a Roman Catholic priest who came to understand the scriptures from the original languages. And once they did that, they realized Roman Catholicism was and is a pack of lies. Every one of them was a Roman Catholic priest, but not only were the reformers Roman Catholic priests, they were humanist scholars. They were from the intelligentsia of the Roman Catholic priesthood. Okay. Once they went back to read the scriptures in the original language, they realized Roman Catholicism was a pack of lies, a complete paganized distortion of biblical Christianity. And they were trying to correct the errors of Catholicism. In some ways they did, in other ways they failed to, they corrected error with error. And eventually they came up with a system of hermeneutics, of interpreting the Bible, that was based on 16th century Christian humanism. Calvin was a humanist. The reformers were second generation humanists. The real forerunners of the reformers were the humanists. People like Erasmus of Rotterdam, he was the main one. You can say, or it is said, that he laid the egg that Luther hatched. And there was John Collett in England, and there was Lefebvre in France, and these were humanist scholars. Well, they went back after the Renaissance, studying the scriptures in the original Greek and then sometimes Hebrew, and this opened the scriptures up, and people, instead of reading the Vulgate, and even then, many people couldn't even read the Vulgate. Even the clergy had mendicant orders. There were illiterate priests. But once people went back to the original languages, they began to realize certain things, that salvation was not sacramental. It was based on faith. So they made rules based on humanist scholarship. If you were to read John Calvin's secular work, his commentary on Seneca's De Clementia, you'll see that he interpreted the Bible with the same rules. Grammatical, historical exegesis. 
grammatical historical exegesis is right in what it says, wrong in what it fails to say. It's not that it says anything false particularly, it's just what it fails to say. And they have certain rules. If the plain sense makes sense, seek no further sense. That's rubbish. You have a peshet and a pesha. Don't muzzle the ox when he's threshing. Seek no further sense. Well, wait a minute. Paul made further sense of it. <laughs> There's a deeper meaning to the ox than an animal who's pulling a plow. It's not biblical. Another one of their rules is this. There are many applications of a scripture, but only one interpretation, also pure Protestant rubbish. Well-intentioned rubbish, but still rubbish. Jesus said, no sign will be given to this generation except the sign of Jonah. In one of the Gospels, he said the sign of Jonah was three days and three nights, as we'll see in this passage. Another place, he said the sign of Jonah Nineveh, the Gentiles repented when the Jews wouldn't. The Gentiles would believe in Jesus when most Jews would reject him. Jesus gave two entirely different interpretations to the same passage. The rabbis said there's multiple, literally 70, as a, simply as a uh, hyper, hyperbole, instead of hyperbolically, multiple interpretations of a scripture. There are different aspects. Well, Jesus was a rabbi. He had more in common with the way ancient rabbis taught the scriptures than he did with the way the Protestant reformers taught the scriptures. They're not wrong in what they say. They're wrong in what they fail to say. When we go through the scriptures now, as this passage, we're going to look at this thing. What is for the own, the own time of Amos? What is for the first coming? What is for the second coming of Christ? What is for some combination? What is literal? What is figurative? What is both? What is ethnocentric purely for the Israelites, for the Jews? What applies to the Jews that also applies to the church? Let's look at Amos chapter 8. Thus the Lord showed me, and behold, there was a basket of summer fruit. And he said to me, what do you see, Amos? And I said, a basket of summer fruit. Then the Lord said to me, the end will come for my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. One literary device that is used in the Old Testament that does not come across in translations well is Hebrew wordplay. Hebrew wordplay. I'm speaking now biblical Hebrew. Summer. Kayets, kayets, summer kayets. The end as in termination kets. What do you see? I see a basket of Priyakayets, because the kets is near. Kayets, kets, it's wordplay. In the Septuagint, the word would be karpas, karpas. In biblical Hebrew, you use wordplay for the opposite reason you use it in, say, English. In English, when you use wordplay, it's either a joke or an advertising gimmick. You take one word that sounds like another, and you do it for a joke or for an advertising gimmick. You know, uh, let us sympathize our watches <laughs> instead of synchronize. Or I remember as a little boy, there was a newspaper advert of a company my grandfather showed me, and it was called Quality Coal, K-O-A-L. Well, they misspelled coal. In English, when you use wordplay, it's either as an advertising gimmick or as a joke, basically. In biblical Hebrew, not modern, but in biblical Hebrew, it's the opposite. When you use wordplay, it is not to make a joke or a gimmick. It's to draw somebody's attention to something very important. 
okay? For instance, there's a verse in the nativity narrative of, of Matthew, he shall be called a Nazarene. It's called the formula citation. This fulfills what was spoken by the prophet, he shall be called a Nazarene. There is no such verse, he shall be called a Nazarene. But there is that the Messiah will be called a righteous branch. Nazarene is with a Z, Zion, the Hebrew letter Zion, but then you have a letter, Tzamek, he shall be called a Netzer, Nezer, Netzer. You use another word that is pronounced almost the same. Hebrew, you have Netzer and Nezer. Hebrew, you have a soft H, He, and a raspy one, If you say, instead of, it can be a different word entirely. Okay, just change one letter. Well, Eastern languages are like that anyway. Oriental languages are generally like that. But you use the wordplay to draw somebody's attention to something very serious. The Assyrian captivity is impending. He shows them a basket of summer fruit. In Israel, you have two harvests. By summertime, if the fruit is not harvested, the sun in the Middle East will burn it up and destroy it. Figs can survive up to a point because the fruit grows underneath the leaves. But essentially, if it is not harvested by the summer, it's finished, it's destroyed, it's too late. It is too late. Jeremiah picks up on this. Chapter 8, speaking of the last days. Summer is past, harvest is ended. And he says, and there will be those who will say, we are not saved. We are not saved. Summer is ended, harvest is past, we are not saved. There will be those who will realize in the great tribulation after the rapture that they were not saved. The foolish virgins are going nowhere. Same theme, same concept in these events leading up to 721, 722 BC. What do you see? I see a basket of fruit, summer fruit, kayats. The kets is near for my people. The end has come, I will spare them no longer. Now notice he still calls them his people. The song of the palace will turn to wailing in the day, declares the Lord. Many will be the corpses in every place. They will cast them forth in silence. This is very similar to what will later happen with the Babylonian captivity in the, in the uh, Book of Lamentations. Eha. Now notice the palace. To them it was the palace, not the temple. You understand? Isaiah warns about this. Woe to the crown of the proud drunkards of Ephraim. You see this today. The church is the bride of Christ. A faithful bride seeks the honor of her husband. Her husband, in turn, honors her. A faithful bride seeks the honor of her husband. Her husband, in turn, honors her. But a Jezebel bride simply uses Ahab as a ticket to glorify herself. <laughs> okay. One of the things that happens in the last days is the auto-deification of the church. You deify the institution. This is a characteristic of false religion. We explain this on the David and Goliath tape. False religions and cults, they all worship the ism. I apologize to those who know this. If you know a Jehovah's Witness, when you talk to Jehovah's Witnesses, you realize it's not about Jehovah. It's about the Watchtower Society. Their real God is the Watchtower Society. They worship the ism. We're the Church of Jesus Christ, a lot of dirty signs. I got a burning in my bosom and I testify to you. Church, a lot of dirty saints is true. Well, they're trying to revamp their image. It used to be Latter-day Saints in big print, Jesus in small print. Now they're trying to make themselves look mainstream Christian. So it's Jesus in big print, Latter-day Saints in small print, but it's the same lie. Mormons worship Mormonism. If you really understand Roman Catholicism and you don't see real cultural Catholicism in Australia, you'd have to go to the Philippines to see real Catholicism or one of the countries like Ireland or something like that or Poland. You don't see real Roman Catholicism in Australia. It is too tempered by secularism and by Protestantism. It's not real Catholicism, cultural Catholicism. You don't see it in Australia, but you would in the Philippines. Well, you realize 
it's not about Jesus or about Mary. It's about, quote, unquote, Holy Mother of the Church. Devout Catholics deify the Roman Church. They worship the ism. Fundamentalist Muslims worship Islam. Hasidic Jews worship Talmudic Judaism. Every false religion, every cult in the world deify the institution, or they worship the ism. When this gets in among God's people, the spirit of Jezebel gets in, the husband simply becomes the ticket for the bride to put herself in the limelight. The focus becomes on the church. The things you see happening today in the church, Manifest Sons, Latter-day Reign, the Word Faith Movement, all of these things are the deification of the church. The ministry becomes an idol. The work of the Lord becomes more important than the Lord of the work. Jesus simply becomes the means to deify the institution. They're no longer raising funds for the work of the gospel. The so-called work of the gospel, or at least their version of it, that simply exists as a means to generate funds. The boots go on the wrong feet. Whenever things become corrupted, you will always find that. God's people will go the way of the false religions and the cults of the world. They will get into auto-deification. They will get into the vanity of the mirror. Well, look what's happening here. It's not the temple. It becomes the palace. That's what they're looking at. Just look at the Vatican. <laughs> it's not the holy city of the Bible. Jerusalem was. Heavenly Jerusalem is. Hear this. The songs of the palace will turn to wailing that day, declares the Lord. Many will be the corpses in every place. They will cast them forth in silence. Hear this, you who trample the needy, to do away with the humble of the land, saying, when will the new moon be over so that we may sell grain and the Sabbath that we may open the wheat market to make the bushel smaller and the shekel bigger, to cheat with dishonest scales, so as to buy the helpless for money and the needy for a pair of sandals that we may sell the refuse of the wheat. Notice they were keeping the religious observances from Leviticus and Deuteronomy, the new moon, the Sabbath. It was simply there as a way to merchandise things. We have a book table in the back, tape table. Personally, I don't take any royalty for many of those tapes. I refuse to take royalties from the CDs and DVDs. Our ministry, we use the proceeds of what we sell to subsidize what we give away. We give stuff to unsaved people for free. We give stuff to poor countries for free, to prison ministries, rescue ministries for free. If somebody comes to me and they're broke and they want a tape, we give it to them. We give stuff away. To, I don't take any royalties. It's not a business. Now, we have expenses, and we use that stuff to pay for petrol and things like that, but we're not in business. You want a tape and you're broke, we'll give you the tape. You get some money, you can mail it in, mail a contribution, but we're not going <laughs> to freely you receive, freely give. I'm not in the business of selling tapes. I'm in the business of giving away Jesus. These people were different. When will the new moon be over that we may sell grain, the Sabbath that we may open the wheat market? Notice their religious observances were only there as an enterprise. Increasingly, you're seeing this happening in the church. It goes back to Peter Wagner. More and more church growth philosophies are based on marketing strategies that come out of Fuller Theological Cemetery in California. The whole Apostles, apostolic reformation, the apostles and prophets lied, a whole nonsense. What's the purpose driven based on? Marketing psychology, combined with new age, but it's basically marketing psychology. Find out what kind of product people want and give it to them. It's a racket, it's a business. They are running churches as an enterprise. Now what happens when you have an enterprise? Well, 
This may not be biblical, but we have to have it because if we don't and the people want it, they'll go to the church up the street. People wind up leaving church A for church B. <laughs> They're competing with each other when we should be competing with the cults and with the mosques and with the Church of Rome and with the secular world. Yes, people should leave bad churches for good ones. That is absolutely for sure, but that is still not real growth. Real growth is people being born again and discipled. Well, they begin running the ministry like a business, like an enterprise. That becomes their focus. These organizations, and they, they run like businesses. Now look what it says. To make the bushel smaller and the shekel bigger. To make the bushel smaller and the shekel bigger. Bushel is the measure of grain, the bread. The less they teach the word of God, the more they talk about money. The more they talk about money, the less they expound the word of God. The New Testament says very little about money, and what it does say, it is essentially a warning. The love of money is the root of all manner of evil. If you chase wealth, you'll lose your faith. These liars of Satan are telling people, if you're not getting the wealth, you don't have any faith. And calling it Christianity. But it isn't Christianity, it's mammon worship. As we've said a number of times, they don't teach faith in Jesus, they teach faith in faith. They prostitute the word of God. The New Testament says very little about money. Very little except to warn about it. Not the wealth itself, but the love of it. Not the riches, but the danger of it. Turn on any of these money preachers, I guarantee you, it'll be a very rare occasion when they don't talk about money. <laughs> Some of them, on the average, like Copeland, they speak of money up to 70% of the time. Creflo Dollar speaks about money 70% of the time. Hin, the same. They talk about money. They don't expound the word of God. They don't know the word of God. They wouldn't know how to expound the word of God. The shekel gets bigger. The bushel gets smaller. Now, of course, what they wind up doing is diverting huge amounts of money that should be going to honest missions and evangelism. Things that should be going to honest ministries wind up going to the Joyce Meyer facelift and earring fund. She needs another facelift. The first one obviously didn't work, but anyways. Twelve million a year? But she doesn't teach the word of God. It's the refuse of the wheat. Now, I've got no problem with what somebody looks like. As you can see for yourself, I couldn't get a date in the woman's house of detention. <laughs> but when you're so driven by vanity, you're getting facelifts <laughs> one after another, then you're fair game. <laughs> the plaster surgeon lifts it up, the earrings pull it down. One of these days, she's going to shake her head and those earrings are going to knock her teeth clean down her throat. <laughs> Do you understand what unsaved people think when they watch this stuff on TV? They make fun of it. If by the unmerited grace of Jesus, I was not already saved and I saw that stuff, I wouldn't want to get saved. I would think getting saved was a con job. Now let's understand this. I was with Philip Powell. Some of you know who Philip Powell is. He showed me a DVD of Joyce Meyer. She's up there. She looks really butch. Now, again, where's her husband? That's the Jezebel spirit. And she said she learned from one of the other money preachers. She didn't call him that, but that's what it is that when you give to the Lord, he gives you a receipt. So when you want something, you bring the receipt to him and he gives it to you. 
Here it is. Here's the receipt. I gave to you, which by implication meant her ministry. <laughs> here's the receipt. This is what I want. Cough it up. She taught this. God is no man's debtor. If your motive for giving to God is to get something, don't give. No matter what you give him, we couldn't even begin to make a down payment for our salvation to begin with. And she said, this is what it says in the original languages. Well, it so happens, I can speak Hebrew as she does English, and I'm told by believers from Greece that my Greek is pretty good. The word for a receipt in Hebrew is Kabbalah, where you get the term for mystical Judaism, Kabbalah. Does not apply. God does not give you a Kabbalah when you make a contribution to her ministry. <laughs> in Greek, however, we have two words for receipt in the New Testament. Tetelestai, or I think there's a form that just says telestai, and arabanon. Tetelestai was what in Koine Greek was on the stamp when you paid a bill and it would be stamped paid in full. It's in John's Gospel. It is finished, paid in full, to Telestai. Jesus said it is finished. The price for our sins was paid in full. No purgatory, you don't atone for your own. Your sins are paid for in full, to Telestai. That's the first receipt we get in the New Testament. Nothing to do with money. The second word for receipt in Greek is arabanon. Arabanon is variously translated into English as pledge or earnest. The arabanon is the Holy Spirit. When you're born again, you receive the Holy Spirit. So when Jesus comes back, he sees who has the arabanon, and that's who he takes. It's like if you order a parcel before Christmas or Hanukkah or something like that, and on the parcel, there is a ticket with a number. And you come with the receipt with the same number. You present it to the clerk, and it matches. That is the Arabanon. This proves you've been bought. The Holy Spirit proves we've been bought by the blood of the Lamb. Holy Spirit is our receipt. These are the two Greek words for receipt. Telesai and Arabanon, that's all. This woman who teaches lies, taught people in your country that when you give money to the Lord, meaning to her ministry, by implication, God gives you a receipt, it says in the original languages, and then when you want something, you take the receipt to him. This is a complete fabrication. It's a total lie. Now it says in James 3.1, let few of you be teachers. Teachers will be judged more strictly than the rest. When I stand up here, I'm going to be held more accountable. I am going to be held more accountable on the day of judgment than most of you. If I'm not willing to take that responsibility, I have no business standing up here. You understand? Let few of you be teachers. Teachers will be judged more strictly than the rest. You cannot teach God's people error with impunity. The things that may be wrong in my life, and there's plenty, are indefensible, inexcusable. I make no <laughs> possible defense of the indefensible. But if I stand up here and mislead you with false doctrine, in God's eyes, that is a whole other level of culpability beyond what's wrong in my personal life. You understand? I can mislead God's people. I can mislead the sheep. Instead of taking them to living waters, I can bring them to stagnant waters, to poison waters. Instead of keeping them away from the wolves, I can lead them right into a den of wolves. Let few of you be teachers. How dare that woman stand up and do what she does? Now notice her head's not covered, is it? I don't mean the literal hat, but where's the male authority? 
This is the Jezebel spirit, the self-deification, self-glorification. And what does it come down to? She teaches error, and it's about money. It's simply about money. That's all. It's about money. She taught a lie. There's no such thing in the Bible. But people will listen to her. We're told the shekel gets bigger, the bushel gets smaller. The more they talk about money, the less they expound the word of God. The less they expound the word of God, the more they talk about money. It becomes a business. Purpose-driven lie is not a biblical model of mission or evangelism or church growth. It is simply a business plan. But who becomes the victims? They cheat with dishonest scales. We're told three times in Proverbs, differing weights and measures are an abomination to the Lord. So as to buy the helpless for money and the needy for a pair of sandals. I have seen people like Benny Hinn go to poor countries like the Philippines. When I was in the Philippines, I was sleeping in the slums. They have man-eating mosquitoes in the Philippines. We wouldn't believe it. Uh, they will not only take it from the haves, they will take it from the have-nots and have no scruples and no morals about doing it. How can you take one penny out of a third world country? Now, I can see how you can have love offerings in the third world, but leave the money in the third world. Take up the money and just leave it for the local church or the needy people in the church. And the... Taking the collections is fine, but what are you going to do with it? How can you take one penny of God's money out of a third world country? Have they no scruples? No, they don't. They buy the helpless for money, the needy for a pair of sandals. I went up to Benny Hinn in Maui, in Hawaii, about two years ago, a year and a half ago. And he's always on television, how he was born in Israel, which he was, his family was some kind of Greek, Arab, Roman Catholic. But he's born in Israel, and how he knows Hebrew, and the Hebrew says this, and the Hebrew says that, and he knows he was born in Israel. I went up to him. Eyeball to eyeball, his bodyguards are there, his honchos. And I said to him, Excuse me, you mean you don't speak Hebrew? Not really. So I got a list of false prophecies this long that you made in the name of the Lord. The word of God says you're a false prophet, and I can prove it. You want to repent and get out of the ministry before it's too late. Tell him right to his face. Doesn't matter. It's not about that to them. It's about the bushel getting smaller, the shekel getting bigger. So as to buy the helpless for money and the needy for a pair of sandals, that we may sell the refuse of the wheat. Notice it's junk, it's refuse, it's waste product, it's junk. And they sell it. They sell junk. What does Joyce Meyer sell? Junk. What does Benny Hill, Hill sell? Junk. Benny Hill, Benny Hill, I like ben, I, I would expect to see Benny Hill in heaven before Benny Hill. <laughs> At least he admitted he was a comedian. <laughs> They sell junk. The Christian bookshops are loaded with junk. You want the Pilgrim's Progress or you want A.W. Tozer? They'll have to order it special. You want junk? Plenty of that. As long as you don't mind paying top dollar for it. Verse 7, the Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob. Indeed, I will never forget any of their deeds. When you see Jacob, it is always ethnocentric. 
Isaiah, the Hebrew prophets write Jacob and Israel, Jacob and Israel. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Israel can have Christians grafted in to the Israel of God, the true remnant of believing Israel with the faithful remnant of Gentiles grafted in. But Jacob is always ethnocentric. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. Hatekofat Hatzarat Yaakov. When you see Jacob, it's something specific to the Jews. Because of this, will not the land quake and everyone who dwells in it mourn? You have trigger words that should automatically cause you to put a two in the margin of your Bible. Two word, uh, trigger words that make you put a two in the margin. Two for second coming. There are certain key words that are used repeatedly to herald eschatological events with the return of Christ. One is quake, and the other, uh, this, in this particular, one of them is, is, is quake, and also the idea of mourn. They'll look upon me who they have pierced and mourn as one mourns for an only son. You see this kind of language in Jeremiah, in Revelation, in Romans chapter 8. These are trigger words. What happened in 721, 722 BC, prefigure, foreshadow what's going to happen eschatologically? These events happen again. Indeed, all of it will rise up like the Nile, be tossed about and subside like the Nile of Egypt. It'll just come up and then... Pshht. But verse 9, it will... Come about in that day, declares the Lord, that I shall make the sun go down at noon and make the earth dark in broad daylight. Then I shall turn your festivals into mourning and your songs into lamentation. And I will bring sackcloth on everyone's loins and baldness on every head, and I will make it a time of mourning as for an only son and the end of it will be like a bitter day. Notice verses 9 and 10. First coming, second coming, or the prophet's own time. Let's understand this. Turn with me, please, to the Gospel of St. Luke. Twenty-third chapter, verse forty-four, please. It was now about the sixth hour, being twelve noon, as they reckon time then, and darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour. Okay. You have a prophecy here that the sun would go down at noon. Secondly. We have a prophecy in verse 10 that we see will have a future meaning, but it also had a nearer term meaning when Christ died. Let's look at Zechariah 12.10. I will pour out right on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication, so they will look upon me who they have pierced and mourn for him as one mourns for only son. They will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. Now look at John 19, 37. Gospel of John, chapter 19, verse 37. And again, another scripture says, they shall look upon him who they have pierced. Do you see how that prophecy in verse 10 is about his death, but it's also about his return? Is it for his first coming, his second coming, or both? Well, it's about both. Zechariah 12 is yet to happen, but John 19 did happen. Let's go back to Amos 8. When Jesus dies, it gets dark. We know it's talking about his crucifixion. The sun will go down at noon. This could not be 
a eclipse because Passover is the 14th of Nisan. By the lunar calendar, it is the diametric opposite phase of the lunar calendar. It could not be an eclipse. The sun had to go down. Paul writes in Corinthians of the first heaven, of the second heaven, and the third heaven. The first heaven is the atmosphere of the earth. The second heaven is outer space. The third heaven is eternity. Three heavens. Time depends on planetary motion of the second heaven. Time is determined by the second heaven. Seconds, hours, days, it all depends on planetary motion. So you get the first heaven and the third heaven, but it's space that separates the two. Okay. What we call in Hebrew, shamayim, the heavens. In Greek, uranus, uranus. We read in Zechariah and in the book of Revelation, the sky will be rolled up like a scroll. We have two Greek words for time. Chronos, we get the word chronology, and kairos, which is like a clock, time like a clock. I've explained this before on other tapes, on the Thanatology tapes. Eternity is not a clock that keeps going. Eternity is no clock at all. There is no time in terms of kairos. But there is chronos. Remember what Jesus said, okay, in Revelation. Come up hither and I will show you. In the book of Revelation, John sees future events happening in the present. He sees past events happening in the present. Past, present, and future are all the same. When a believer, a saved Christian, gives up the ghost, their spirit enters eternity. They are in the conscious presence of the Lord relative to them. Relative to us, they're asleep in the ground. But relative to them, they're in the presence of the Lord. The Bible, of course, never speaks of the death of a believer as death. It's always sleep. Talita Takumi, the little girl's asleep. Lazarus is asleep. Paul says, do not be overly grieved for the brethren who fall asleep. Well, there's two reasons the Bible speaks of the death of a believer as sleep. One, obviously, is you wake up again. The alarm clock, the last trump, you wake up again if you go to sleep. Are you afraid to go to sleep? No, then don't be afraid to die if you're a believer. Real death is second death. It's not the first death. The first death is merely perfunctorial. The only things that matter are the eternal things. Biological birth and biological death are mere formalities. Real birth is second birth because that's the only one that's going to matter in eternity. And real death, God forbid, is second death for those who don't have the second birth. In eternity, biological birth and biological death will be irrelevant. It is only the second birth and the second death that matter. You go to sleep. That is one reason the Bible uses sleep as a metaphor and an illustration of what happens when we give up the ghost unless the Lord comes first. However, something else happens when you go to sleep. The neurophysiologists tell us we always dream. That is true. When you dream, you can see past events happening again as if they were happening in the present. You see future events transpiring as if they were happening in the present. In a dream, past, present, and future are all the same. Things that would make absolutely no sense whatsoever in your waking hours seem logically coherent in a dream. You can see dead people alive again and talk to them in a dream. Well, that is what happens when you go to sleep in the Lord. Your consciousness enters a different sphere where past, present, future all become the same and there's no per se death. The dead in Christ are alive again. You understand? That's the two reasons the Bible uses death to uh, sleep to teach about biological death for a Christian. I'm not talking about unsaved people. It's something else. Now, let's understand this. It depends on the second heaven. Planetary motion depends on the second heaven. But the second heaven will be rolled up like a scroll. Eternity and earth will meet. Time and space will meet eternity when the heavens are rolled up like a scroll in Revelation and Zechariah, okay? Time, kairos, this time depends on the second heaven. 
There are, however, certain times in the Bible where God intervenes and interferes with time, supernaturally, even before the skies are rolled up. One time, Joshua, remember? Sun stops, 48 hours. Day is not 24 hours, it was 48 hours then. Okay. Time, God intervenes with time. You had a king of Judah who died at a time when somebody's average lifespan would have been about 50. Some lived a longer. A king of the Jews had his life cut off when he was in his 30s. Only it didn't quite happen, he prayed. And God added 15 years to his life. The sun went back, remember? Well, that had to be balanced out. That Jesus died, another king of the Jews, died in his 30s, so the life of the other could be extended. The death of Jesus balanced out, the, the premature death of Jesus balanced out the premature, the, what would have been the premature death of Hezekiah. You understand? Because they're both kings of Judah. One's life was cut short by 15, so one's was added. Okay? But the sun went back, remember? God intervenes with time. Revelation 16. The day will go from 24 hours to 16. A third of the day, a third of the night will disappear. Okay. Do I believe that the earth was made in six literal days? Yes. Do I believe those days were 24 hours? Doesn't matter. <laughs> Jews count time for any kind of ritual or religious purpose based only on the creation narrative in Genesis or Lehoshek, light to dark. The Sabbath is sundown to sundown. Fasting, sundown to sundown. The holy days, sundown to sundown. It doesn't matter if there's one hour of daylight or if there's 10 hours of daylight. Once the sun goes down, it's a day. You understand? For any kind of purpose, Jews only count time based on the creation narrative of Genesis. Therefore, it literally had to happen. The earth had to be made in literal days however long they were. Well, you get the question, did Jesus die on a Wednesday, did Jesus die on a Thursday, where do you get the three days, three nights? And people go on about this, and you can read Edersheim, you can read about the two Sabbaths, understand what it's, in physics, in medicine, in most sciences, the simplest solution is usually the correct one. In criminal investigation and forensic science, we are told by those experts in such things, the simplest explanation is usually the correct one. I'm not being dogmatic, I'm simply saying it's the simplest, most straightforward solution. You'd have no problem saying Jesus died on a Friday. Why? Because the sun went down. It was not an eclipse. It was the 14th of Nisan. It was mid-month. It was the opposite phase of the lunar cycle. The sun did literally go down when he died, fulfilling this prophecy. Now, it has a future eschatological meaning, yes, but it happened. We read in Luke 23, it became dark when he died. When you take his corpse off the cross and bury it, the sun goes up, then the sun goes back down again Friday night. You still have three days and three nights as a Hebrew counts time. It's only based on the creation. A literal setting of the sun, a literal rising of the sun. Time is only based on the creation. Yom is always literal. The word yom is always literal and it's always based on the creation. A literal rising and a literal setting of the sun. No problem, three days and three nights. He could easily die on a Friday because there was two sunsets. No problem. Now, there are others who offer other explanations, but I'm simply saying you'd have no problem arguing for a Friday when you understand Jews took time, day, literally, as a literal word, based not on this, but based on how many times the sun went down and rose. Then I'll turn your festivals into mourning and your songs into lamentation. When Jesus died, the Passover was turned into a time of mourning. Instead of a time of liberation, it was a time of mourning. But it goes on. I'll make it a time of mourning for an only son, and the end of it will be like a bitter day. 
And so we read in John 19, they mourn as one mourns for an only son on Passover. Literally happened. But Zechariah 12 tells us it's going to happen again. There's going to be astral phenomena. Things are going to happen in the heavenlies when Jesus comes back. And those who survive the great tribulation, the one-third of the Jews who survive it, will look upon him who they have pierced and mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. It will literally happen again. What was for his first coming? What is for his second coming? What is for both? It is for both. John tells us it happened the first time. Zechariah says it's going to happen again. God will once more intervene and interfere with time. We're told that in Revelation 16. Verse 11. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine for bread or a thirst for water, but rather for hearing the words of the Lord. His first coming... From the time of Malachi, Malachi Hanavi, until the time of Yohanan Hamatbil, John the Baptist, there had not been a prophet for over 400 years. The closest thing they had were the Maccabees. Then came the Hasmonean period, but there were no prophets. When he comes again, it's the same thing there will be a famine for the hearing of the word of God. If there's anything which is defining the present state of the body of Christ in most of the world today, it is a famine for hearing the word of God. You people are being fed by God's grace the finest of wheat. If you have any sense, you'll know you're not going to get this stuff in most churches, are you? There's people in churches like the Assemblies of God and stuff, the way they've gone, now they used to be different 25, 30 years ago. I'm talking now. They've never had a Bible study. There's people who've been saved 30 years have never been taught the Word of God. I had a picture, I had a dream, a couple of verses out of context, now it's motivational speaking. They've never been taught the Word of God. They wouldn't know what it is. They're being fed the refuse of the wheat but they don't know anything about Scripture. Before Jesus comes, there'll be a famine for the hearing of the Word of God. Now, what happened during that famine the first time? John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah. Elijah, Elisha, and John the Baptist all have the same spirit. Somehow, during this period, that will happen again. Always the same pattern. Jezebel coveted the vineyard. The wicked woman coveted Naboth's vineyard. This brought her into conflict with Eliyahu Hanavi, Elijah. So Jezebel, the wicked woman, turned King Ahab against Elijah. Remember? What happens with John the Baptist? Herodias, the wicked woman, turns the king, Herod, against Elijah. It's the same pattern. There was a famine for three and a half years in the days of Elijah, remember? What are we told about Antichrist and Daniel in Revelation? Two times a time and a half time? 1,260 days? These things will happen again. You have to understand what happened in the days of Elijah to understand what Amos is talking about this happened in his first coming, but it will happen in his second coming. There'll be a famine for hearing of the word of God, and the same thing will happen. The wicked woman, the spirit of false religion, will turn the political establishment against God's people. They'll cover the vineyard, the church, the Israel, literal geographical Israel, certainly. Days are coming, declares the Lord. I'll send a famine. Notice, God will send a famine. God will send a famine. If you don't want my word, I'm not going to give it to you. <laughs> you 
you don't want my word, I won't give it to you. I tried to give you the truth, but you weren't interested. What do you want from me? I was happy to feed you the finest of wheat, but you weren't interested. I will send a famine, a famine for the hearing of the word of God. These people do not realize it, but they are, in fact, under divine judgment. They reject his word, therefore they will not have any word to reject since they don't want it. They want to have their ears tickled, go have your ears tickled. You want to eat refuse, go buy the refuse. There will be a famine for the hearing of the word of the Lord. Now, remember Amos is setting the stage for his successor, for Hosea, talking about the harlot and so forth. Look with me how the stage is set. Turn with me, please, to the book of Hosea. He's going to be succeeded now. Chapter 6, verse 2. He will revive us after two days and raise us up on the third day that we may live before him. Because Jesus' death is our death, his life is our life. We also raise up on the third day. There are those who suggest they may be right. I'm not saying they aren't. There are those who suggest that because a day with the Lord is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day, as Peter quotes in the Old Testament, it may suggest that the return of Christ will be somewhere in the early part of the present millennium. In other words, possibly in our lifetime. I'm not saying they are wrong. I'm simply saying we never speculate about specific dates. We are told not to do that. However, what is for sure is, as he rose, we will raise. You have no problem getting the third day being a Sunday. He had to raise on a Sunday because it was the Hebrew feast of first fruit. It had to happen then. The question is, what day did he die? But there's no problem getting the three days and the three nights. Story then continues. Why is it that there's no grain? Well, it's a judgment. If there's no rain, there is no grain. Look at Isaiah chapter 44, verse 3, please. Isaiah 44, 3. I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my descendants on your descendants. The rain being poured out is a picture of the Holy Spirit being poured out. You've got the former rain and latter rain, but it causes the grain to grow and to be harvested. No rain, no grain. He withholds the rain so there's no grain. Why is there no revival? God's not pouring out his spirit. <laughs> now, Elijah fed Shunammite woman and her son, remember? Despite the fact there was a famine, the dish was never empty. For those who love the Lord, even though there'll be a famine, your dish will never be empty. I'm not saying it'll be easy. But I'm saying the faithful will not starve. David says he's not seen the faithful perish for a lack of bread. This famine is coming. This famine is upon us. This famine is sent in judgment. However, the faithful will still have God's provision. They always did. They always will. Let's look at this further. Verse 12, 
the people will stagger from sea to sea, from north even to the south. They'll go to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, but they'll not find it. And that day, the beautiful virgins and the young men will faint from thirst. They'll be desperately seeking the word of the Lord, but they'll not find it. A time is going to come when the virgins are going to look for the word of God. What does it say in Matthew 25? In the Olivet Discourse, Jesus is talking about the last days. The old-time Pentecostals used to sing, Give me oil in my lamp, keep it burning. The illumination of the Holy Spirit in the lamp, Thy word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. They have a Bible, but there's no oil in it. They don't have any illumination of the Holy Spirit. They don't know. All they've had is hype. A time will come when the foolish virgins will try to get the oil, but it'll be too late. A time will come when people will know they've been malnourished. They'll look for the grain, but they won't get it. Because they're under God's judgment. The time to get the grain is before the famine comes. Remember Joseph was told there was going to be a famine for seven years? Store the grain up ahead of time. Get the word of God now. You're going to need it when the famine comes. Get the word now. As for those who swear by the guilt of Samaria, who say, as your God lives, O Dan, and as the way of Bathsheba lives, they will fall and not rise again. Something bad is going to happen. Something very bad is going to happen. It is going to happen in the character of what happened in 721, 722 B.C. It will transpire again. There'll be a long, prolonged period of famine. But people will not know there's a famine because they will be eating the refuse of the wheat. They will be being taken to the cleaners by people who make the bushel smaller so they can make the shekel bigger. You want the refuse? You'll have plenty of refuse. But you won't have plenty of grain. After that, judgment will fall. They will realize what has happened. They will desperately try to find the word of God, someone to teach them, someone to tell them. They'll desperately want to know. The calamity that's coming upon them will have them in fear and trembling. The shaking, the quake. They'll be desperate. They will not know how to cope with it because they were never taught how to cope with it. They were taught, you're a king's kid. You don't have to suffer. Name it and claim it. Blab it and grab it. When they find out that doesn't work, what are they going to do? Well, they're going to try to find out what will work, but it will be too late. These are frightening thoughts. But this is what Amos said it's going to be like. You'll find in most of these churches... Many of these people have never heard a sermon from the book of Amos. In fact, many of them have never read the book of Amos. In fact, many of their pastors have never read the book of Amos. They wouldn't know how to sort out what is for the first coming, what is for the second coming, what is for Israel, what is for the church, what is literal, what is figurative. They wouldn't, by and large, even have as much as a clue. A time will come when they're going to wish they did. A time will come when they will desperately try to find it. But it doesn't matter what they try. They're not going to find it. The grain will not be there. In the meantime, what happens? In the meantime, the shekel gets bigger. The bushel gets smaller. Well, not for us. For us, it's not about the shekel getting bigger. You give as the Lord leads you. 
We have orphanages for AIDS babies in Africa. We need money. Every honest ministry needs money. I'm not saying we don't. But when I need money, I don't go on one fundraising drive after another. I ask the Lord to give us the money. <laughs> He's never turned us down. I never asked him for a Mercedes. I asked him for a wheelchair. I asked him for antiretrovirals. I asked him for Bibles in Swahili. I never asked him for a private jet for me. If I had an airplane, I would tow a banner, Jesus is coming soon, and fly it over soccer matches. What happens? The shekel gets bigger. The bushel gets smaller. I want to make a pledge to you people. As long as you come to Moriel, it will never be about the shekel. By the grace of the Lord, it will always be about the bushel. God bless. Blessings, dear friends. Greetings in Jesus. This is your friend Jacob Prash speaking to you at the moment from the UK. You know, so many of the questions we get in our Roku broadcast and on our Vimeo clips and on YouTube deal with subjects that we deal with much more extensively in our books. We can't, for the sake of brevity, uh, go into the kind of depth in a TV broadcast we can actually go into in a book. But so many of the questions come from material that are expounded in the books on a much more broader scale that it's almost frustrating sometimes that we can't spend hours and hours answering the questions that, that are given to us. Obviously, practicality dictates that's not a possibility. The books are there. They're available. They're available in print in the Moriel catalog on the Moriel website, moriel.org. But in this day of Kindle and electronic books, they're also available through Amazon, and they're available through Kindle. Kindle. The three books that would be the most referred to in the questions we receive are the three latest books. First being The Dilemma of Laodicea. The Dilemma of Laodicea is an exposition of the seven churches in Revelation, culminating with the final two churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea particularly, setting the stage for the return of Jesus. The Dilemma of Laodicea would be the first. The second would be Shadows of the Beast. Shadows of the Beast. How the coming Antichrist, how his identity will be revealed to the faithful church. The rapture will not happen, will not happen, absolutely not happen, until the faithful church knows who the ultimate beast of revelation is. That is the Antichrist and also the false prophet. How the identity of the coming Antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church, Shadows of the Beast, the second book. And the final and latest one, Harpezo, Harpezo, what the scripture actually teaches about the rapture, the snatching away which takes place between the sixth and seventh seals in the book of Revelation. So these three books, Blum of Laodicea, Shadows of the Beast, and Harpezo, all available on the Morio catalog, all available through Amazon, and all easily available electronically by Kendall. Thank you so much, dear friends. God bless. May Jesus be with you.